This podcast is part of Mishmash Media. Hey, buddy. Hey, how's it going? Good. Welcome to the penultimate episode of Season 4, The Survivor. And this is Curbcast. My name's Ivan. And I'm Stephen. And every week we get an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm in chronological order, and we review it scene by scene. And uh, like I did say, Steve, we are up to the penultimate episode of season four, probably the best season so far. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree with that so far. I had to think about that for a sec. But the first half of the season, I thought was not as good as season two or three. The last few episodes have really picked it up. And I would say overall, yeah, it is my favorite so far too. Yeah, it's been uh, been amazing. An incredible journey. And uh, we'll be doing season five pretty soon. Yeah, two weeks. We'll be starting season five. Can't wait. You can't listen to us on any uh, platform service. Well, you probably are right now, obviously, but we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that kind of stuff. Uh, social media, you can find us uh, at Curbcast Pod on uh, most platforms. And uh, Steve, what else we got? Uh, we have a Facebook group called uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm Fan Club. So check that out on Facebook if you want to join a bunch of other Curb fans talking Curb and talking Larry. We also have a Patreon if you want to support us financially, patreon.com forward slash mishmash media, which is the name of our fledgling podcast network, which we put out Curbcast under. And we'll be adding some content in the coming months once we get the network uh, up and running. It's been a bit of a delayed project because of COVID and a whole yes. bunch of other stuff. But this year mm-hmm. is the year that we're actually making it happen. So if you want to support us in the meantime, time a couple of bucks a month that would be awesome and like i said content will be rolled out in the next couple of months once we get all of our ideas into well into reality i guess once we make them happen mm-hmm. yeah it's finally, all been talked the last little while and uh but we're yeah. gonna finally get it on board can't wait yeah i think covid sort of uh derailed a lot of things so we can't let that uh, oh, be yeah. the excuse anymore so before we get into the episode proper i also wanted to just give a shout out to our listener jane robertson she commented on last week's post on our Facebook and she lives in Christchurch in New Zealand and she was very kind and she said to uh, or on the post that she looks forward to our episodes every week and uh, that was just really nice to read. We do know that we have a dedicated little fan base. You know, we can kind of see repeat listeners in different countries when we look at our listening data and we do get uh, the occasional comment or message or something like that. But just to see it is, is really sweet. So thank you so much, Jane, for the kind words. And uh, yeah, we, we hope to continue making you, well, not making you, but we hope that you continue enjoying our podcast uh, over the next, what, six, what, a year? How long have we got left? Yeah, year and a bit? yeah. Something like plenty, that. plenty, yeah. A while. <laughs> There's plenty that's going to happen. Plenty. Yep, plenty of years. That's right. But yeah, thank you so much, Jane. Yeah, we uh, we read every comment and everything like that. So, uh, yeah, we love when you give us feedback and uh, when you reach out to us. It's very, very nice. So, thank you. That's right. And also, finally, we have an email address, curbcastpod, one word, at gmail.com. Let's do it. Season 4, Episode 9, The Survivor, aired in the US for the very first time on March 7, 2004. In this one, generations collide at a dinner party when a contestant from the television show Survivor and a Holocaust Survivor clash. And Larry is caught in the middle. Larry and Cheryl renew their vows, but Larry has had a hard time remembering his or his lines for the producers. And uh, yeah, this is a, a couple of weeks out from the show and or a few weeks and Larry is still Still, uh, still can't get his lines down for the musical. That's uh, that's pretty worrying for him. Yeah, and it does cause a bit of cause a bit of consternation throughout this episode, and even into the next episode when it you know is the actual season finale with the producers. I guess it's his first like you know it's his first major acting role at least in theater. So you know it, you know I'm guessing it's probably a common problem for any any uh, young or you know first time theater actor where you know it takes a while to get good at remembering lines. Even if you're even if you're in the entertainment industry, it's it's a totally different form of pressure. So I kind of I kind of understand why Larry's a bit nervous you know not just from forgetting his lines but just you know nervous I think the nervousness is making him forget his lines but then that's just adding to his nervousness you know it's kind of uh, a bit of a cycle for him I agree and and what a debut for him I mean he's Max and the producers like the lead <laughs> that's a pretty big uh, pretty big debut yeah it kind of reminds me I mean obviously you know Larry's not he's got a uh, a very solid creative history behind him so he doesn't have anything to prove to anyone but kind of reminds me of like when a um there was a band that Macaulay Culkin had that were called uh, about four or five years ago, or maybe actually probably closer to 10 years ago. They were called the Pizza Underground, and it was him and a yep. couple of friends, and they would cover songs by the Velvet Underground, but they changed the lyrics, the original lyrics, to be just about pizza, and that was their whole thing. They just did bad covers <laughs> nice. of the Velvet Underground and sing about pizza. And nice. because he's, But because he's Macaulay Culkin, even though he hasn't been a well-known actor for 20 years, like in terms of his work, they got like a headlining spot. It was like their first or second show and they got like a major headlining spot in a festival in Spain or something like that. Like nice. you know, like a pre like a premier music festival. 
And it kind of reminds me of that where just because of who he is, even though his band is objectively fucking garbage, because of who he is, he, autom- <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't have to like yep. grind it out like bands with nobodies in them. Um, so it kind of reminds me of that in a way, yep. just because he's Larry, he gets, obviously Mel has an agenda, which we'll talk about mm. next week. We find out, yeah, we find yeah, out next episode what the agenda is, yeah. The, mm. Exactly, yeah. Like the, opportun- uh, the opportunity is only afforded to Larry to star in such a role first, you know, first time because of who he is. And it just reminded me of that Macaulay Culkin thing. Yeah, yeah, because Larry, by that point, you know, obviously we've we've said many times he's had his fame from Seinfeld and uh, it carries through into uh, the Kirby universe as well. Yeah, every time he, every time he, it's common you see it, you know, where actors or, you know, if they want to become musicians or vice versa, they don't have to start from the beginning like people who aren't already famous. You know, they just, they sort of get a free pass straight to the front of the line because they're already famous singers or actors or, you know, whatever. So, I mean, I can mm-hmm. understand it, but it's, I'm sure it's frustrating for a lot of people. Yeah, well, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> what can we do? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get into the episode, mate. So, scene one of The Survivor. In this one, Larry is waiting for his dry cleaning as the lady is yelling at her co-worker. He walks up to the lady, her name is Anna, and says hello. He says his suit needs to be cleaned as he and Cheryl are renewing their wedding vows. He is talking highly of Cheryl as Anna begins to flirt with him. And he asks if the suit can be ready for tomorrow And Anna, as Anna is still flirting with him. And he goes, do I need a ticket? And Anna says, no, you don't need a ticket, Larry. So she's uh, pretty keen on him and he, she could be the 10th anniversary gift. Yeah, they're really uh, setting that up for Larry. You know, he doesn't have to try, he doesn't have to charm anyone, he doesn't have to, you know, make himself like an idiot. It's just there for him on a platter. But of course, being Larry, he'll fuck it up. You already know that. I don't know how, <laughs> but, you know, you know that it's going to happen. He's not just going <laughs> to close this, uh, you know, close this deal easily. But yeah, she's flirting very aggressively with him. She changes her whole attitude. You know, she's quite harsh to her co-worker. And as, so- and, uh, as soon as Larry comes to the counter, she softens. She's much more friendly and, yeah, obviously very attracted to Larry. And, yeah, it makes it very obvious, sending very clear signals to Larry. Yeah, and it's a good setup for the episode too because we see that how uh, you know uh, him and Anna end up going to a hotel. So uh, yeah, and um, well, unfortunately things don't happen. Spoiler alert! But uh, yeah, we do see like it, it kind of builds up to that moment. Yeah, I think you know they they've only got two episodes left. They've kind of got a you know for the season they've got to wrap up the producer storyline, which has been you know the major the major theme or one of the major uh, storylines throughout the season, and also. Larry trying to get laid before his 10th anniversary. They've only got two episodes to sort of pay those storylines off. So they're, you know, they're hitting the ground running, which, you know, makes sense because they've got to, got to pack it all in as well as whatever's going on in each episode, aside from those two major plot lines. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, plenty going on. That's right. In the next scene at the synagogue, Larry walks in to meet with his rabbi. Uh, Larry thanks him for doing the vows. He asks the rabbi who the man in the photo is, and he says it's uh, his name's Andy Silverman, his brother, and he died in 9-11. And uh, Larry asks if he died in the World Trade Center. But uh, in, in a dark twist, the rabbi says he was hit by a bike messenger in uptown New York, nowhere near the uh, events of that terrible day. Larry asks the rabbi about his 10th anniversary gift from Cheryl and what his thoughts are on it. And uh, rabbi tells a story about Abraham and his wife, Sarah and that Sarah said Abraham can get with their housemaid to have relations with and that Larry can't believe what the rabbi is saying as the rabbi says he should accept this gift from his wife and the rabbi says he can come for dinner tomorrow and if a survivor can come as as well uh, Larry says this is fine as they shake hands as Larry is about to leave so a bit of a bit of dark humor in this one it was 9-11 it was still quite raw at that time that was three years prior to the episode or about three years prior to the episode being released and yeah, it's kind of uh, the fact that that kind of humor was a thing in the 2000s. It's uh, it's quite, you know, quite sad that the rabbi's brother died, of course, but it, it's kind of funny in the fact he died on the same day, but not due to those events. Yeah, I guess like 9-11, you know, even now or, you know, forever, it will be a, a topic, you know, it's such a solemn, horrible situation and topic that no joke should be made about it under any circumstance. But I guess when you really think about it, the joke is not on, you know, it's not about 9-11 or the victims of 9-11. It's about this rabbi who's trying to sort of, you know, the joke's on him and him trying to sort of like take advantage of the tragedy by sort of lump it. Like you said, it is, it is sad that his brother died, but he's mm. trying to lump, you know, he's trying to, he's trying to encapsulate his brother's death into the the general tragedy and, and horribleness of 9-11. So the rabbi is kind of being a bit disingenuous and a bit unethical. You know, he's trying to group his brother into a, a separate tragedy. So, you know, I think, I think that's why they can get away with the joke because the joke's not actually about 9-11. It's about this sort of like, you know, this um, opportunistic rabbi, I guess. Yeah. Do you think he would 
use that story for like sympathy or or anything like that? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say because he does seem, you know, we we do see throughout the episode he's a very he seems like a very moralistically like morally driven person. He doesn't seem like a, a dodgy sort of person. But I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a case of like he's so you know like his brother's death is so incomprehensible to him that to lump it into the general tragedy of nine eleven makes it easier for him in a way because that's 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 a tragedy that everyone in America and you know most of the world struggle with. Like it was it was sad for everyone. So maybe maybe that allows him to process his own individual sadness if he can relate to you know if he can sort of like acclimate himself into broader tragedy. I don't, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. He does, maybe yeah, that maybe, makes he sense. Do, maybe he doesn't feel so alone because he can like he can link it to a tragedy that everyone's feeling sad about and it makes yeah. him feel less isolated or something. I don't know. That's a, that's a that's a positive reading of it. Or he could just be a bit of a bit of an opportunist and, and <laughs> sort of try and get extra sympathy out of the situation just because it was on the same day as 9-11. Yeah, oh, that's the way it goes. But yeah, it, it makes for pretty good humor. Even Larry's pretty shocked. Yeah, I think I think Larry's more just like yeah, just like yeah, he's like shocked and confused. He's like, what's what's your brother's death got to do with you know the the twin towers being struck? Like that's lots of other people died on that day that had nothing to do with uh, you know <laughs> New York or or the the other you know planes that struck the other targets. So yeah, it's it's I think Larry's just a bit like yeah you can't you can't really you can't just tack your brother's death onto it and say that he's a victim you imply that he's a victim of 9-11 in the same way that those victims were you know yeah yeah absolutely yeah, but yeah pretty uh, pretty funny scene yeah no i like yeah it's a good one larry is going through his producer's lines as cheryl's parents and sister are arguing a cheryl asks larry how the lines are going and he can't learn them due to the racket or the noise that they're all making they're all arguing upstairs he tells her that the rabbi will bring a survivor to the dinner and if his dad can bring their survivor friend solly so that they can share their experiences cheryl is fine with it as she asks how larry's vows are coming along he says they're not ready as she reminds him of his 10th anniversary gift she reads out what she has for her vows at the moment and uh, she says uh, in the last line she says she'll love larry for all of eternity and larry interrupts her at that point he asks if the marriage will continue into the afterlife as cheryl calls him out for it he thinks the marriage will end at death and that they begin arguing about the concept he thought that he'd be single for eternity and cheryl says he won't be single at that point and they'll be together i mean it's pretty pretty petty and pretty childish but i do get larry's point i mean when you're no longer a physical being and your soul has manifested into the afterlife i guess you could really do whatever you want right well i guess it depends on how seriously or how literal you take those vows because i've never been married but you know i've i've been to enough weddings to know that when people say you know i'll be with you until the end of time or until you know for, through all eternity you know most people just say it as you know it's symbolic of the endless love or the endless time you want to spend with someone but i guess if you take it literally or if you're if you're a devout believer in an afterlife especially like a christian or a catholic afterlife where you know you get married in under the eyes of god i can understand why but but it's weird for me because cheryl they've never added that to a character she's never been religious at all let alone devout so it doesn't make sense to me that she would interpret it literally you know as maybe a, as maybe a devout christian would where it's like no no you know once we get to heaven we're still together because that's what we believe so it was a bit it was a bit i liked it i thought it was you know it was a funny point of tension between the two but it was strange that cheryl was so committed to that idea of like no no eternity she was taking it literally rather than like a symbolic description of you know the love you have for someone although we have seen cheryl's family is religious and we have seen them head off to church they went to them to, to go to church and stuff as well so she does have i mean she's not a devout catholic but i think she does have you know she's quite secular uh, and of course i mean she married a jewish guy so i mean she's not uh, yeah, she's not uh, true. truly devout but yeah but i get your point i mean yeah cheryl doesn't really bring up any theological kind of conundrums or any kind of ideologies during the series so yeah it's one of those rare times where she brings out her uh, christianity maybe it's a case of like you know i've met people in my life who maybe were they grew up Catholic or Christian and then you know as they become teenagers and then young adults they kind of drift away from it and they don't become like strict atheists but they just sort of seem like non-practicing you know Catholics or Christians but they still hold on to a few ideas or a few customs you know of, of the more devout part of their life like yeah, yeah you know they might they might not go to church every Sunday but every Easter or every Christmas they'll go you know even though it doesn't have any specific relevance to them it's they're just holding on to a few bits and pieces of that more serious you know belief or when it's a more serious part of your life so maybe it's like that with Cheryl where for some reason she still holds on to that idea of eternity in terms of commitment but most of the other parts of, of the Catholic faith or the Christian faith don't have any major role in life. But for whatever reason, that particular idea of eternity does. You know, it's just one of those mm. one of those leftover bits that still is important to her as an adult. Yeah, yeah, I think so too, yeah. But uh, it's funny how Larry's just like, nah, after death, we're good, man. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> 
Well, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a Jewish thing as well. Like maybe Jewish people believe that in the afterlife, maybe they've got a different idea of what, you know, what a marriage is in the afterlife. I don't know. Maybe maybe for him, it's more of a, rather than, oh, I didn't sign up for this. Maybe it's more of a case of like, no, no, that's that's not what, even though he doesn't say it, maybe that's where he's coming from, that Jews don't actually have, that idea is not part of the Jewish faith, that eternity is how long we're together. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, so uh, I can't comment. Yeah, if you if you know, if you're a Jewish person or if you, you know, if you want to be married to a Jewish person until death or until eternity, whatever, whatever works, uh, let us know. Or if your spouse has ever said you're going to be married through to eternity, let us know too. Yeah, how did you how did you take that? Did you take that literally or were you like Larry and just said, whoa, 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 I didn't, I signed up for death, <laughs> not, not, not eternity. <laughs> I doubt we'll find anyone, but you never know. Who knows? <laughs> At the dinner party, Larry walks downstairs in his dry clean suit as Cheryl and he are talking. He greets the rabbi and a young man named Colby who is the survivor, as in a contestant from the reality TV show. Colby says he loves Jerry Seinfeld and Seinfeld the show and he asks Larry how Jerry is going and Larry says, eh, he's good. And then he walks off. Becky goes up to Colby and introduces herself as Larry greets a Holocaust survivor named Solly. He invites Solly to the vow renewal as he asks about the other survivor <laughs> and <laughs> Larry points to Colby as Solly and Larry's dad are confused and I, I don't I, I don't remember Colby at all but I do remember when Australian Survivor came out I think it was like the second or third season I was a teenager when it came out and I remember when it was like a big deal it was on TV and it was the fact that they were going to the Australian Outback and stuff it was a I remember it was a pretty big deal over here but I, I don't remember any of the contestants of course but yeah I think Colby he was indeed one of these survivors which is uh, which is funny as it's funny that you know you've got like a survivor who survived the Outback albeit it with a production company and and that sort of thing, and then you got like a Holocaust survivor as well. It's uh, it's quite a comparison. Yeah, I mean, being a contestant on Survivor would be a challenge. That's the point. It's not to say that he didn't endure any hardship at all, but it's a controlled situation. You know, like if there's a medical emergency, they've got a medical crew. They've got you know, if someone is starving they've got food it's not that you know it's a, it's even though they're put in tough situations and they need to push themselves it's still entirely controlled and they've still got teams of every single person and every single resource they would need if they if they go a bit too far or if they get into a situation that's uh you know a bit too risky yeah uh, what i was going to say before was that you're right in that i think the second or third season of survivor was americans in australia but there was also an australian survivor with australians like there was an you know there was an australian version of the show as well as the American version coming here for a season. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a bit later on the Australian Survivor, but I do yeah. remember the like when this when this show when this episode was set. I do remember Americans came to Australia to, yeah. to partake in it. I think this is what what, what it's referencing. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I, I realize. That. I just meant to say that you know there was an Australian version as well with Australians. Yeah, I think there was a I think there was a few seasons of it. Yeah, of Australian yeah, Survivor. I think yeah, it did pretty well. Mm. And this was like the early two thousand early to mid two thousands. It was like the golden age of reality TV where it was still a fairly novel concept you know this is the the peak time of big brother all around the world survivor probably a bunch of other shows that i can't remember you know like reality shows were the the pinnacle of of you know of television culture and ratings sort of thing so survivor was massive you know it was huge yeah huge big deal it was a big deal and uh it's funny how they got someone from survivor into, into the show pretty pretty good writing pretty pretty hilarious yeah i i liked how they you know yeah it was it was clever how they misled you to think that you were going to meet another holocaust survivor or, or sully was sully was but it was just a contestant on survivor it was yeah it was clever yeah, writing it's great interesting how the rabbi like this is also another dimension to the character that shows him as a really unethical kind of guy i mean a rabbi of all people saying i'm bringing a survivor yeah you think he'd know about the holocaust this guy's really unethical man and he's very misguided yeah it is that's a good point actually i didn't even think of his part in the situation that yeah he would know it's like because all larry says you know all he says is survivor but i think to a jewish person that has a very specific meaning like if you know you don't have to say holocaust survivor you just say survivor and i'm guessing that that you know that means of it most jewish people you know, especially older Jewish people whose parents were maybe like Larry and the rabbi, you know, they're sort of in their 50s and 60s. Their parents would have been, you know, or, or their generation before them would have been Holocaust survivors. So, you know, that word has a specific meaning. So the rabbi, yeah, he definitely knew what Larry was talking about. Even though he didn't say Holocaust survivor, he said survivor. The rabbi knew. So the fact that he sort of, he, used, he took advantage of the situation by just using because it was just the word survivor not holocaust survivor he kind of took advantage of the situation and said oh well i'm going to bring a survivor too you know if larry if larry said holocaust survivor then he couldn't have gotten away with it because you know yeah. the holocaust eliminates you know that that makes it specific 
But yeah, you're right. The, yeah, the rabbi this this rabbi is a bad guy. He's a bad. Yeah, guy. he's a bit, bit of a bit of a bit of a shit rabbi. He is. Geez, how did he become a rabbi? I got no idea. <laughs> In the next scene, Colby talks about his time on the show when they filmed in Australia. Sully interrupts and tells him about his Holocaust experience as he downplays Colby's experiences. They begin to argue about their experiences and how bad each of them were. Sully gets angrier and knocks some liquid on Larry's shirt, uh, Larry's suit rather. Uh, Cheryl's mother asks for someone to get a sponge as Larry says she should get it herself. It kind of escalated really quickly and Sully got really, uh, really out of control. And I love how they're both trying to one-up each other, Sully and Colby about their experiences yeah look i kind of understand where they're both i kind of have a bit of sympathy and also frustration with both of them because you know sully sully doesn't realize that he's been set up uh, sorry the the i can't remember the, i can't even remember the survival colby colby. colby 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 doesn't realize like that he's been sort of set up by the rabbi you know to be implied to be a holocaust survivor like he's ignorant of the whole situation he thinks that he's just turning up mm. as a survivor contestant so when he's when he's talking to the to the rest of the table about his experience on survivor you know he's not doing anything wrong he's not trying to sort of you know like shit on sully but i also understand why Solly's frustrated because he he thought he was he he expected to meet another Holocaust survivor, which you know at this stage a lot of them had passed away, and also he's a I guess a I'm think I think he's German or you know Austrian maybe by his accent. You know he's living in America as well, so there's even less chance of meeting Holocaust survivors in another country. So he's disappointed mm, yeah. and frustrated that he's kind of been unintentionally misled but he shouldn't have yelled at, at colby either because colby wasn't when he was describing his experience on the show he wasn't trying to shit on or outshine sully he was just talking about it because people are interested but then sully had a right to yeah, yeah, yeah in general yeah. because he's like well you know i thought something i thought i was going to meet someone who went through the, the same horrible shit i did and you know you just you're just here talking about you know a bloody tv show so they're both kind of right and they're both kind of wrong i think though once yeah. once colby you know once sully loses it which i don't think he had the right to do colby should have just shut up and let him you know when colby mm. tried to like compete with him and and you know out out hardship him that's when it was just like dude just shut up just stop talking. <laughs> like let you yeah. know like he shouldn't have interrupted you but also don't try and pretend that you've gone through something similar when you haven't <laughs> sometimes we wouldn't eat for a day oh we wouldn't eat for a week a month <laughs> Yeah, he's like, he's like, we had to, we had to have rations, and we didn't have snacks. And so he's like, snacks. Sometimes we didn't eat for a week. <laughs> yeah, I didn't eat for a month even. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we didn't even have a bathroom. Bathroom. Oh, oh, oh. we yeah. had news. Yeah. What did you have? Newspaper. <laughs> Newspaper. <laughs> we didn't even. And Colby's like, we didn't even have that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, they're just yeah. one upping each other. So great. Yeah, and just just when he's like, you know, the Australian outback, like we were close to to nine out of the ten most poisonous snakes on earth, which is technically true. Most, you know, a lot of them do live in the Australian outback. It is, but again, they're on a TV set, they're yes. in a controlled environment where all of that shit. It's not like they were just like lowered out into the middle of the outback by a helicopter and then said, "Okay, you're on your own. We'll see you in a month." Like everything was managed, everything was controlled. You know, there would have been safety protocols and all sorts of things in place to prevent that. So even though they were close to snakes, the chance of them getting bitten was so little that you know, yeah. it's almost irrelevant. The production team were having buffets, you know, with the catering department while uh, yeah. while the other guys were trying to survive. Yeah, exactly. It's like going to a zoo, <laughs> you know, a very controlled environment where everything's managed and everything. There's a protocol for everything. It's like going to a zoo and going to the reptile exhibit and going to all the most venomous snake tanks and being like, oh, you know, yes, you were very close to venomous snakes. And there is very some small chance that you could have gotten bitten, maybe. But the chances are so slim because of the environment you're in. You know, it was just like, yeah, shut up, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shut up, dude. <laughs> yeah, a funny scene nonetheless. Nine of them inhabit this region. Oh, oh, it was oh, harrowing. Oh, oh, you come across a taipan on the trail, you get bit, you're dead. Oh, 30 oh, minutes flat. Oh, 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 I'll tell you, that's a very interesting story. Let me tell you. I was in a concentration camp. You never even suffered one minute in your life compared to what I went through. Look, I'm saying, I'm saying we spent 42 days trying to survive. We had very little rations, no snacks. Snacks? We, what are you talking snacks? We didn't eat sometimes for a week, for a month. Don't. We weighed nothing. I went from home. I mean, I couldn't even work out when I was over there. They certainly didn't have a gym. The next day, the Davids are getting ready for their vows. Larry says he can't get his suit dry cleaned with the wine stain on it as they're closed. He suggests that he'll go to their van, which is parked outside the house, to get it cleaned. He pulls up to the house and is greeted by Anna. Larry tries to explain the situation as Anna is flirting with him once again. He asks Anna if he can get his suit from the shop 
and if they can just walk over. And he's, uh, Anna. Anna asks if he wants to come in for a drink. Larry declines as he's renewing vows with his wife. Anna flirtatiously says she will give Larry the keys to the shop. And uh, Larry says, oh, I've been married to Cheryl for 10 years. And Anna says, I've been married to my husband for 10 years. So they have uh, they have something in common, but it doesn't uh, persuade, it doesn't uh, dissuade her at all. No, I think, I think uh, you know, she's probably not very happy in a marriage. And I think she's trying to, she's trying to slowly lure Larry in. She's like, yeah, I've been married for 10 years, 10 long years like she's trying to yes. really sort of like make larry think about how 10 years is a long time and then after 10 years you'll never be able to do this again like he's, she, yeah, <laughs> she's really trying to paint a picture of like how drawn out it's been and how like what a slog it's been like 10 long years i i know how you feel you want to you want to fuck other people Let's yeah do you want to blow the cobwebs out and uh, and blow me <laughs> <laughs> Let's like let's that. do it. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But she ends up giving her the keys to the to the shop, and uh, he goes over to to go grab his his uh, suit. Yeah, which is very very trusting of her. I mean, I guess because she's got a major crush or a, you know physical attraction on Larry towards Larry, she's you know she's she likes him, so she's willing to do that. Anyone else, and I think she'd tell him mm. to go go fuck themselves. But <laughs> pretty much, and it's the yeah, Sabbath like, too, so she doesn't work on the Sabbath. That's true. Yeah, that's true. She can't drive. Yeah, I think it would be a case of if it was anyone else saying, "Hey, can I have the keys?" She'd say, "Go fuck yourself." But uh, because it's Larry, he's like, "Can I have the keys?" And she's like, "Well, come fuck me." <laughs> fuck me, then get the keys. Yeah, exactly. Larry is driving over and spots Jeff in his driveway. He explains that he and Anna went to the store and to get the soup, uh, the suit rather, not the soup. Whoops. And uh, and they arranged for his tenth anniversary gift with her. And Jeff is stunned when, uh, as Larry says, the rabbi also has his blessings as well. So Jeff's really happy for his friend here. Yeah, he's. Uh, I mean, Jeff's always been a, a supporter. Of, like he's always trying to g Larry up and encourage him to do this and that to to take advantage of it. Like I think throughout this season, Jeff has been living vicariously through, even though nothing things happen with Larry's you know 10 year anniversary gift the thrill of it potentially happening is something that gives Jeff vicarious joy you know he's really every time it comes up it, it excites Jeff he's like yeah like he's really keen on it more even more so, he's, he's more keen for Larry to do it than Larry is yeah, he's he's very excited for his friend, probably because, well, Jeff has cheated before, but uh, he's never had the blessing from Susie to have sex with other women. So I think Larry, I think Jeff is kind of jealous too. Oh, totally. Yeah. He's like, you know, he is being a good friend in that he's encouraging his friend to do something that, you know, most people I think would take advantage of. Like he's being a supportive friend, but yeah, he's also, I think he's trying to, it's, it's almost like he's trying to alleviate the jealousy by overcompensating in the excitement for Larry, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. He's uh, he, he probably wants to have sex with Anna instead. <laughs> That's how excited he yeah. is. <laughs> well, yeah, like you said, he has cheated, so he's obviously, uh, you know, obviously wants to have sex with other people. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that Larry's got an opportunity to do it ethically um, or consensually, you know, is is exciting for him because he knows that he can't do that, and he's gotten caught. Yeah doing it the wrong way before. <laughs> That's to, right. Say, I do want to say as well, um, we didn't bring it up during the initial scene with the rabbi, but the fact that the rabbi, I mean, you know, the rabbi makes a good point. You know, he uses a Bible story as sort of like justification for Larry to, you know, to go for it. But I wasn't expecting that. I thought the rabbi was going to be a bit like advised that Larry shouldn't do it because it's, you know, against mm. their vows or, or whatever. But the fact that the rabbi is like, no, no, it's, you know, he's like, he's not being a creep about it. He's not like, yeah, go fuck someone. Like, that's awesome. Like, yeah. High five, bro. He's not being like bro -y or douchey about it, but he's very supportive and I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Well, probably like because he, he recited the story about Abraham. So maybe maybe because it, it ended up, uh, you know, in, in the, the scriptures, <laughs> he probably thought, well, it's something that was in the scriptures. So Larry is fine to do it. Yeah, no, no. I, I understand like... What I mean is that I wasn't expecting it from just like a plot point of view, because I guess mm. usually when, you know, the, the stereotype in, in TV shows or, or movies, when someone goes to a priest or a rabbi or, you know, like a imam or, you know, some religious figurehead for advice, usually it's, you know, they've got a bit of a moral quandary or they're a bit uncertain about something and the priest or the, the imam or the, the rabbi is usually a bit more conservative about it. But the fact that mm. the rabbi, it, I just wasn't expecting that from like a, from a plot point of view that the rabbi would be entirely supportive. I think he would, I thought he was going to be like, well, no, you shouldn't do it because of, you know, whatever reason. It was just an unexpected, you know, an unexpected plot development, I guess, the fact that he was supportive. Yeah, because otherwise that would cause complications for Larry and it would do it would be a subplot as well on how he can deal with it. Yeah, and I, I guess they probably chose as well to go against that stereotype of that religious figurehead usually, you know, would usually like say that, no, they shouldn't do that because it's against whatever belief. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that kind of worked. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. It was a nice surprise. Yeah, me too. Anyway, with this scene, uh, Jeff says that he needs to show up 
with a sheet when Larry has sex with her, because apparently that's what the Yazidi Jews do when they have sex. Jeff goes to Susie and uh, and Sue and Jeff asks if this is the case and Susie confirms that a hole is cut in a sheet to have sex in. Larry says he'll cut the hole uh, with the sheet when he has sex with her as he drives off. What a weird freaking, it's like one of those like mythical, it, it kind of reminds me of those of those really old timey old wives tales. You yeah. know, it's like people like I, I've heard, because being of Italian background, you hear like weird stories from like 200 years ago and then you you think of them now or like traditions and it's like no we don't they don't do that stuff anymore that's weird that's a bit outdated it was probably something that the Yazidis did probably like 500 years ago yeah yeah maybe <laughs> maybe a handful of them still practice that but it's not widely you know it's it's not something that's done for the most part in their culture you'd have to be like really orthodox like ultra orthodox Yazidi yeah, Jew to probably do it or orthodox yeah yeah, yeah. when you have said to Sicilian you'd have to reminds me of the i think is it called the evil eye you know where you get people's you get like a it's like a curse sicilian people place on other people is it called the evil eye i think so maybe yeah there's an, like, i think there's a name for it i don't know what it is yeah it, i think there is like an italian name for it but i've just heard it being referred to as the evil eye i heard about it from the sopranos because there's an episode where tony soprano goes to italy and, she, and he meets up with a, with a sicilian oh sorry a, an italian mafia boss and she's really super and that's the woman yeah isn't that yeah, the woman yeah, yeah. She's the mafia yeah. boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she she is getting her nails clipped by a like a beautician or like an assistant or something. And she takes the nails and her fingernails and burns them. And Tony's like, "Why did you burn your nails? Like, why didn't you just throw them in the bin or whatever?" And uh, and she said, "Well, because if my enemies get hold of them, because it's part of me and my body, they can place the the curse on me. Like, so it must be like the thing right. that they need. Yeah, you know, they must need a physical part of their enemy's body, you know, nails or hair or something like that too." to yeah. enact the curse so yeah but i don't i don't think many people do that these days no i don't think so i don't think you can do that no it's uh, quite superstitious no. i'm sure some people do but yeah i don't think most people do <laughs> yeah, i don't think so either that's very weird i've never heard that one before but yeah i, I, I don't remember that in sopranos but yeah it's, it's kind of weird yeah and it's cool and i think to break the curse you have to the person who placed the curse on you the only way to break the curse is to rip out their eye okay Nice. Yeah, that's. I think that's the only way to to get like to cancel the curse or put it back on them or something like that. So. Just an excuse to cause violence. That's all it is. I think so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> mafia, mafias kill each other all the time, so it's probably just a you know a bullshit reason. Be like, no, no, we are you killing each other over money or curses? Uh, yeah. Curses. It's course. like yeah, we have to we have to chainsaw every single limb in their head to break yeah. the curse on our family. You know, yeah, we, we we've have... got to do it. We got to chain them up and just go Scarface style and just cut off all their limbs. You know? Yeah, we have to pump the them full of bullets and stick them in a car boot. Otherwise, the curse isn't broken and we don't want that. Yeah, and the concrete boots, that makes sure that they never go to heaven, you see. So, exactly. <laughs> so the concrete boots put them on the bottom of the ocean or the river and, and they can't, their soul can't go to heaven. So that's why we do it. Yeah, it's like, so all of your killing is is not just like sadistic, you know, crime stuff. It's like, no, no, it's all cultural. It's all cultural. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all good. So Sicily, the culture capital. Italian, they'll be like, of course. What what else do you expect them to do? Sicily, the culture capital of Italy, huh? Exactly. You go to Palermo and you badmouth them straight to the bottom of the river. That's right, and your soul will never enter the pearly gates. Exactly. You think it's a mafia <laughs> thing? They all do it. No, they all do it. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yep. I can only make these jokes because you're Italian and you're my friend. So thank ah. you for being. Thank you for being that that buffer for me. I appreciate it. That's all right. I know someone who can take you out now for offending me, so it's fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> Just kidding, bro. I am. Um, after the last two years of COVID, I'm like a curse. Where? Who cares? <laughs> this is a yeah, This is a curse. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> this whole two years has been a fucking curse. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, oh no, you curse me. Big deal. Like. Yeah, we've gone through COVID and I had to cancel my wedding and, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's gone through hardship. Fuck your curse. Yeah. Even the curse is like, whoa, sorry, dude. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave you alone, man. Oh, yeah, my God. Like, come, on. come on, curse. <laughs> That's it. Go, go, go curse someone who, you know, go curse like some remote island that hasn't had COVID yet. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> go do that. Larry is dressed up for the vows as Cheryl says her mother will not turn up due to the sponge comment. Larry says he'll go talk to her. The scene cuts to him having a chat to Cheryl's mother. He apologizes to her about it and that the survivor confrontation triggered him to think about the Holocaust because of his uh, Judaism. She says thank you as Larry says she was closest to the kitchen to get a sponge. 
And she says, Larry doesn't respect her. Larry says, <laughs> this is my favorite part of the scene. Larry says, I love everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a people person. Such a bullshit. <laughs> oh, terrible. <laughs> terrible. What a lie. I must say, though, the fact that Larry on the spot came up with, you know, an excuse of, of why he, you know, was, I don't think he was that disrespectful to, to Cheryl's mum. I thought it was perfectly reasonable to say, hey, can you go get a sponge? Like, okay, you know, it's not, she, I don't think she had a right to be that offended. No. Um, but you know, in in the process of Larry trying to apologize, you know, to, to keep Cheryl happy, the fact that he used the fact, you know, he was he was worked up and emotional over the Holocaust argument. That was a pretty good excuse on the fly, you know. Yeah. If I was if I was Cheryl's mum and and Larry came, I would believe that, you know, even though Larry's full of shit, he, he didn't care. He just came up with something on the spot. That you know, that's pretty that's pretty reasonable. Yeah, that is. I mean, I I'd, I'd probably think the same too if I was her. Yeah, I did like how he, you know, to sort of like to relieve the tension in the in the in you know that little scene. Does he grab a nose or something? He like almost like pretends to, you know, when like dads take your nose or whatever. Yeah, I think something like that. Yeah, he yep. or he like pinches her cheeks. He does something very very condescending, and she's a bit yeah. shocked. And then he, he he almost turns into like a like he's talking to a child like yes hey come on like you know like just yeah she's like, like come on let's go to this thing and then she, and then she's like all right I'll get my dress yeah it reminded me you know like when a child's crying and then you know to sort of like distract them or to stop them crying a parent might be like hi hey you know like they'll they'll, mm-hmm. like they'll become like almost clownish in a way yes to sort of entertain them it kind of yes, reminds yes. me of that <laughs> it was fun yeah and she and she even acts like a kid she's like yeah okay I'll get my dress and she's she like, seems yeah, really you're right. happy. like she yeah she gets a big cheery smile and you know again pretty pretty good like larry deals with the situation pretty well like he comes yep. up with a really good excuse on the fly that convinces <laughs> Cheryl's mum. and yeah. you know it's gonna you know you can tell that it's gonna you know she accepts the apology but then immediately they're almost gonna have another argument again mm-hmm. because larry won't let go of the sponge thing yeah then he realizes he's like oh hang on i'm just gonna undo the apology mm-hmm. I'll, I'll lighten the situation up by acting how you know however you want to describe how he acted yeah. who cares if you were closest to the kitchen and yeah. he couldn't get his bunch. Who cares? Yeah. Just yeah, keeps I bringing it up. He the situation pretty well on the fly. Yeah, he did all right. He did all right. <laughs> so anyway, like we said, Larry spurs her on to come to the ceremony as she's laughing and says she'll come to the vows. Cheryl, Larry, and other relatives are in the limo on the way to the synagogue. Larry is blinded by Solly's glass eye. I love that effect where it's like the the ray, like the, you know, like the, the reflection from the light is blinding Larry. And and they kind of do the, the camera as if it's coming from his eye, <laughs> from his face. Yeah, <laughs> I've never heard of a glass eye shimmering like that. Have you heard of that? No, I I don't think it's a thing. Like there might be some very very mild reflection, but I don't think it's. It's almost like Larry had a laser pointer in his face. You know? Yeah, like, like, <laughs> it's like a big a big laser see. pointer that covered half his head. Yeah, and he was moving his arms in a really you know sort of um like a what's the word like a just a crazy kind of way. Mm. And I didn't. Are you I, mocking I, me? Yeah, does Solly does Solly have? I think he's because when it cuts back to Solly, like after Larry's flailing about, Solly's shaking as well. But is, I think they're supposed to. I think they're they're saying that he has Parkinson's disease. I think so. Yeah, but or maybe early see, onset of it. That. Yeah, you don't see that at Larry's at the dinner party when you first meet Solly. So oh, it's, maybe it's early onset, or I don't yeah, know. Maybe uh, he's got an intellectual disability or something. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it's not that important. I just noticed that. No. You know, that, that that was the first time you saw it. Yeah. Well, he probably has, like, some kind of neurological condition, you know, which makes him do that. Yeah, I totally. Don't know. I mean, he's yeah. an older guy as well, so it's, yeah. it's common in older people. So mm. Larry is blinded by Solly's glass eye, and he's, he's trying to get away from it. Solly thinks Larry is mimicking him as he gets upset. Cheryl accidentally spills wine on Larry's, uh, Larry's dry clean suit by mistake. Solly gets out of the car as Larry asks for a sponge. <laughs> so you're right, the argument just kind of reared its ugly head again in the limo. Yeah, I mean... That's usually the case in Curb, where any any good that's done or any progress that's made is usually very short lived. Very short lived, just by just by one line as well ruins everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's any any piece that Larry achieves or any concessions he makes or you know any 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 smoothing over of any situation is usually very flimsy. Okay? Usually, yeah. Yeah, most of the time it's you know it's easily undone. It's undone, and even just one comment can do the whole undo the whole thing. Yeah, because I think most people around Larry know that, you know, if they do decide to accept his apology or give him the benefit of the doubt or, you know, like, you know, try and put put it to rest, whatever the issue is, I think they all know. They're all cynical about it as well. Mm. You know, they're not naive about how the fact that Larry just like, if he unfucks something, he'll just refuck it straight away. <laughs> yeah, I get you. <laughs> so they're all uh, skeptical. Fun, fun. Yeah, well, that, that's Larry for you. Yeah. The scene cuts to the rabbi going through the events of the ceremony with the family and any changes that may be needed. He's getting frustrated as Larry's whines at 
Larry's wine stain, and he says he needs to do something about it. Cheryl's mother asks for a mint. And another thing, Stephen, one thing I have noticed a lot in this season is Larry has been really snarky and really vindictive in this season, hasn't he? He says that she can get it out from his pocket, <laughs> the mint, and Cheryl gets it for her. So Larry doesn't even bother to uh, to go get the mint for her. He's pretty pretty snarky and pretty vengeful. Yeah, look, I th- it seems like in this season, Larry has become a bit more self-aware in that he's finally starting to realize that people actually do think I'm an asshole. Like people... Mm. like doesn't matter what I do, you know, whether it's my fault or not, most people around me, even if they're nice to me, or even if they're my friends like Jeff or, or Richard or, you know, even Cheryl, they still kind of think that I'm an asshole. So it's almost, it, yeah, it's almost like a, fuck it. I'm just going to lean into it. Like if you think, if I, if you think I'm an mm. asshole anyway, I'm just going to, yeah, he's just, he's just sort of become a bit more self-aware about people's perception about him, you know? So it's, he's just, he just doesn't give a shit anymore or he gives way less of a mm. shit. Yeah, I think I think it's just leaning into what. <laughs> yeah, and I love it how he just he just straight up says to, and and it's funny that it's it's like a mint in his pocket. I mean, it's not like the mint is in the kitchen and he's nearest like Cheryl's mum was. Mm. It's like literally like a few inches, a couple of inches from his hand, and he doesn't even get it. What an asshole! Yeah, yeah, I think he, yeah, he's just leaning into his asshole. He's being a bit more nasty. It it kind of started with like around episode five or six. I think it was the five wood. It, I, we, we started commenting on it, on it then where we were like, Larry's just a lot more, his nasty streak's really woken up and he's just like, yeah, he just doesn't care anymore. Especially the way he treats Marty as well. Yeah, especially when, when they were at the baseball game and Marty's, you know, Marty's got the empty seat in commemoration of his late father. And then Larry says, why don't you ask your dad to help you with your car? You know, hello, you know, you can give him a hand, but he's dead. I mean, that's yeah, probably one of the lowest comments he's ever made. Totally. And since then, he's just really, really, yeah, just maintained that nasty streak. So I just think he gives less of a shit. <laughs> Yep, yeah. He just kind of goes on with it. Well, yeah, I think I think we might have discussed it last episode of the episode before where he, he's come to some realization somewhere along the line. Like there hasn't been a, a specific scene where it's occurred to him. It's just like this slowly developed realization that's happened over maybe the last season where he realizes that no matter what he does, he can't convince most people that he's, even though he is an asshole sometimes, he's not this complete ass. Like everyone thinks that he's just the worst person, but he's just, mm. he's the worst person occasionally, but he also mm-hmm. a lot of situations aren't his fault or, mm. you know, he gets the blame for something that someone else did or said or misunderstands i think he realizes he slowly realized this season that i can't control it no matter what i do it's just going to make things worse so fuck it i'll just go i'll just go full asshole that's that's how i'm reading it yeah yeah no i think so too but larry (laughs) this next thing he does it's not deliberate of course but larry says let's roll as the rabbi thinks it's a reference to his dead brother How does he get this kind of shit? I, I, I got no idea. He gets angry and refuses to do the vows. He's deeply offended. Larry says he didn't die. His brother didn't die from the attacks. Cheryl convinces the rabbi to do the vows and he says he'll do it, but just for her. I mean, the rabbi, I, I don't know. I think he just kind of feeds into his stupid mindset, you know, like let's roll as if Larry would have done that deliberately. I mean, come on. Yeah. And like let's roll is a, I don't know, it's such an innocuous term. And it's a common term, you know, like let's roll with it or let's roll or, you know, whatever. Like it's it's such a common innocuous term that you can't expect everyone to go around making sure they don't use the word roll in front of the rabbi. It's like, come on, man. You know, yeah, it's it, and the only, the only mm. relation is that his brother was on a bike and bikes roll, and Larry said roll. Like that's the only connection. Yeah, that's it. And then she, he just got roll. triggered. That's it. He just got triggered. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's, it's a very sensitive thing for him. Yeah, and of it course. It only happened three yeah. years. It did only happen three years prior. And I think what we said before, this kind of confirms my what I thought before, where I think the rabbi to help him process his brother's death, for him to attach it to a larger tragedy, to make him feel a bit less isolated. You know, it's a bit more of a communal grieving or something. Hmm. I think this kind of reinforces that because it's obviously, it's obviously a very sore, raw point. You know, he's still, he's still mourning almost, you know. So any any small trigger just sets him right off. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, like you said, that's his way to grieve. Yeah, and it's still obviously, you know, like everyone mourns in their own time and no one should be told how to deal with something so horrible. But at the same time, you can't expect the whole world to watch every single word they say you know, around you, especially when they don't know you. Like the only yeah. person in that crowd that knows La- uh, knows the rabbi is really Larry. You know, it's not like they're close friends that would know that, hey, we, we should avoid saying this word or bringing up bikes or whatever. Like, you know, that's something I would, I would expect from my intimate friends who know me very well, not yep. just from like casual acquaintances. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's that's the rabbi for you, I guess. Yeah. What is he doing? He's mimicking me. Why are you mimicking me? No, no, no. The, the light from your glass eye, it's, it's reflecting on me. You, you, you're not making fun for me. No, no, no. I don't like this here. I don't want to be here. No more. Hold it. Stop 
up the cow! Yeah. Cheryl is saying her vows to Larry at the ceremony. Larry is trying to remember his vows, but he can't. The rabbi says just to speak from the heart. Larry begins to talk and he says the marriage, he does his trademark, and he says the marriage is pretty, 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 pretty good. He continues with the vows, the improvised ones, and begins waffling as the audience is amused. He says he will love Cheryl till death, which upsets Cheryl, as she says that she will love Larry for all eternity, and Larry eventually agrees to do the same. The rabbi puts the glass wrapped in a blanket down. Larry steps on it too early as the glass cuts up rabbi's hand, and he runs off in pain, and Larry gets blood on his pants and asks for a sponge. He looks over to Cheryl's mum, who is seething at this point. <laughs> So he's got wine on his shirt, on his jacket, and now blood on his pants. Jeez, not a good combo. No, that suit's copped it. He's copped it. The poor rabbi, though. God damn it. Larry wasn't even paying attention. Yeah, I did laugh. As soon as, as soon as um, you know, I could sort of foresee that Larry would either forget or just make up a, or just say like terrible vows. You know, you could see that coming that, you know, obviously the vows weren't important to him at the start of the episode where he doesn't have anything on the go. You know, when Cheryl reads him hers. And he's got nothing. You could foresee that Larry would say something insensitive or make it up on the spot or whatever, and he does. Yeah. And uh, what does he say? He's like, you know, I'm going to love you till death. Most women don't have that. You're pretty no, lucky, no. you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, trying to oh, justify God. it. And it's yeah. in front of the families. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like he can he can be a bit of an ass to Cheryl in private, but when it's on such an important day where you're expected to rehearse saying, you know, the mm. meaningful things in front of mm. all the families. It just adds to, like, the insensitivity. Yeah, it's it, it's funny. But the big twist was when Larry uh, stepped on the rabbi's hand and the glass went through him. We, no one expected that one. That was no, a bit of a surprise. No, I did <laughs> Yeah. And that's the last we see of the rabbi. Yeah, he's out of action. He's probably gone to hospital. It, I mean, that would have been a pretty pretty deep cut. Oh, yeah, massive. Lots of deep cuts. That Put those deep cuts on vinyl, huh? <sighs> Certainly a deep cut. <laughs> I'm inspired by you, buddy. Ah, uh, yep, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. In the final scene, Larry arrives at the hotel room for his gift, his 10th anniversary gift with Anna. He brings his suit and asks if Anna can clean it at her workplace. And I, I agree with Anna here. She gets offended and says that she sh he should go do it himself. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Imagine you're seeing your lover or something, and then they say, oh, can you do this for me? I know it's part of your job. And they're like, well, but you're here for, you know, to you know have, spend the night with me. I'm not going to do this for you. I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't blame Anna at all. Yeah, it's, it's just like if Larry was just meeting up with her for a social visit, that makes perfect sense. But he's like meeting up with her for something very personal, and then he's adding this massively impersonal aspect to the situation, which is, oh, by the way, can you dry clean this? It's like, <laughs> yeah, you, you're kind of ruining the mood here, Larry. Like. Yep. This is a bit of a clandestine rendezvous. It's already like we've only got so much time. What are you like? What are you doing? Just forget the dress. Like, <laughs> exactly. what you, what, like she says, like, are you here to fuck me or are you here to wash suits? Like, yeah. Do you want fuck or suit? Fuck or suit? Yeah. And Larry says the first Some, one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he has to even has to think about it. He's like, oh yeah, the first one. It's like, dude, what? The first. Like time. You know, <laughs> if you want to capitalize on this gift that Cheryl is giving you, time is of the essence. You've got you're a mere couple of weeks away and, you, and you're still fucking around with suits and like what are you yeah. doing <laughs> being silly it always it's almost it's like, like larry doesn't want it either in a way it's like he's kind of i think pushing himself to do it it kind of reminds me of i think it was episode two where larry gets caught feeling can't remember her name but uh richard's quote-unquote niece's breasts you know after she gets her boob job yeah yeah and cheryl yeah. cheryl see i think it's i think that's the second episode and you know the the promise that cheryl makes to larry is still quite fresh and i think we discussed in that episode when cheryl sees it actually happening you know when she sees it with her own eyes that larry is actually going to potentially do something with another woman the reality versus the idea is it is a massively is a different thing Mm, you know, the yeah. idea of it is fun for Cheryl because it's like a sick challenge, but the idea of it, uh, sorry, the reality of it is like, oh, wow, like my husband's actually potentially going to, you know, fuck someone else. It's it's hard to deal with. Yeah. I almost get the same sense with Larry. Like he likes the idea of it. It's a fun yeah. thing to think about. And it's he just doesn't want to do it. But yeah, he can't, like when it comes to following through, you know, he like there are so many opportunities for him, but he, he kind of screws them all up and it's mm. it's almost like self-sabotage. Almost, yeah. I feel like he's, his heart isn't quite in it. No, and I mean, he is, look, he is also a very awkward person who is very bad at reading. Like he's, you know, he's terrible at social situations and, you know, he's probably a bit nervous as well because, you know, Anna is very beautiful and young and she's very direct as well. So that might be a bit intimidating for him as well. Yeah. But yeah, like he just, he just has no idea. <laughs> he doesn't have a clue. No. And, but yeah, it could, it could be, it could be, what are they, you know, there's that term or that idea of like, where people deliberately fail because they don't really want to do the thing, you know. Like, uh, yeah. Like, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, there's a term for it where it's like, it's like self-sabotage. It's like, you're not actually failing because you're not good at it or because, because of circumstances. Yeah. Because of circumstances, you're actually failing because unconsciously you don't actually want to be successful. Yep. It's like, it's, it, it's like deliberate sabotage. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. yeah I, I don't feel, feel like his heart really is, is set on it. No, no, no. I feel like at the start of the season, he was keen on it. But I think since, I think the thing that changed him was probably Cheryl's shock when he accidentally grabbed the girl, the lady's breasts. I think that was probably the turning point. Because I feel like since then, Larry hasn't really, he's been kind of, you know, he's been shining off to Jeff saying, oh yeah, I got my 10th anniversary gift. But I feel like from that moment, his heart wasn't quite set on it after seeing Cheryl's reaction. Yeah, no, that makes sense as well. Because like, even though he is a bit of an ass. To Cheryl and he does mistreat her quite a lot and disrespect her quite a lot. He doesn't truly want to hurt her. And I think when he sees, even though, even though he didn't do anything wrong technically, because Cheryl said, you can do this, you know, he's playing by the rules. I think he knows on some level that it will hurt Cheryl, even though she said she's fine mm. with it. So yeah, you're right. I, yeah. think, I think that's holding him back a bit too. Yeah. No, absolutely. Larry is preparing for sex. Anna's in bed, ready to go. Uh, He has his sheet wrapped around him. You don't see the hole though. Anna asks why he has a sheet on and why there's a hole. (laughs) He says, because that's what he thought Yasidic Jews did. And uh, Anna's like, we don't do that. What the hell are you talking about? She denies that they do it. As uh, they're about to go ahead, an earthquake occurs as the scene cuts to everyone outside of the hotel. And Colby yells to Larry in the crowd to say that they were both survivors of the earthquake. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> hey, oh. look, we, we survived. We're survivors. Oh. <laughs> Colby happened to be there in the crowd and he's like smiling and, you know, waving to Larry. He's so jovial. Yeah, he's got this real like, hey, bro. Like he's like he thinks that he's bonded with Larry because they both, you know, they were both evacuated from a minor earthquake. I think he just wants, it's almost like Colby wants to be able to say that he survived some, you know, like tragic situation so any situation that has a bit of risk or a bit of like any sort of potential of harm to him even if it's minor yeah he, he capitalizes on he's a bit of an opportunist he's a tragedy <laughs> he's opportunist a tragedy opportunist yeah he's an ambulance chaser sort of <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> anyway. he's, a, he's a tragedy chaser <laughs> yeah, he's a tragedy <laughs> he's a tragedy himself by the sounds of it fictional colby yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And that was the end of the episode, The Survivor. I enjoyed this one, Steve. Uh, I give it four Larrys out of five. What about you? I give this one three and a half. I thought okay. it was pretty good. Mm. Um, I can't, re- there's nothing really wrong with it. No. I just no. didn't think, I think after the last few episodes as well, like sort of from like the five wood up until last week's episode, Wandering Bear, like I think that's been, like I think every episode has been four out of five Larrys or five out of five for me. Yeah. So yep. it's been such a good run, you know, and it's probably like the best run of Curb I've seen so far. So I far. Think you would, yep. you know, rate it up there, you know, or close to. So this episode had a lot to live up to and it just, it wasn't bad. I just don't think, it was good, not great. Yeah. the best way to put it. It, it was, was good to see good. Larry. Yeah, it was pretty, it wasn't pretty, 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 pretty good, but it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. It was good to see Larry getting so close to his 10th anniversary gift as well. I think with the exception of next week's episode, opening night, the finale, I I feel like this was like the closest he got to. I mean, Anna was naked and under the sheets ready to go. So uh, he was was almost there. Yeah, I mean, she was serving herself on a silver platter, so to speak, and... Hmm. He still fucked it up. He still rocked it. He up. did. Oh, it wasn't his fault. It was, it was the earthquake. <laughs> it, well, it was the hole in the sheet that did it, but I think it would have been something, if that earthquake wasn't there, I think Anna would have probably still gone ahead with Larry. Because even though at, at that yeah. point, Anna was like, kind of like, hurry up, hurry up, let's do this. She wasn't like, yeah, her flirtation kind of disappeared. Yeah. I mean, there was fumes in the tank of, of like her mood, you know, it was almost yeah. gone and she was like, mm-hmm. okay. And then the earthquake just killed it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it did. It, it shook, it shook it. It shook the foundations, so to speak. It did. Yep. It did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was the penultimate episode of season four of Curbcast. Thank you so much for listening. It's really great to hear from you guys on Facebook and getting emails and stuff. We really, really appreciate hearing from you. If you do want to chat with us, uh, you can send us an email, curbcastpod at gmail.com. We are all also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit at Curbcast Pod. And Stephen, we have a Facebook fan group for Curb, don't we? Yeah, it's called Curb Enthusiasm Fan Club. It's on Facebook. Check it out if you want to join a bunch of other Curb fans. If you want to rate us or review us on your podcast app of choice, that would be amazing. It really helps in a lot of ways. And uh, we'd have a Patreon as well, patreon.com forward slash mishmash media. If you want to support us, that would be amazing. And uh, I think that's it. I think so too. Anyway, my name's Ivan. And I'm Stephen. And we'll see you next week as we finish off season four with the season finale opening night. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye. Thanks for listening. 
This podcast is part of Mishmash Media, an independent podcast network. Follow us on social media at Mishmash Media AU or support us on Patreon. All those links are in the show notes.